Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Bonavera Institute. I'm Kate O'Regan, I'm the director of the Institute, and I'm really delighted that we are going to be launching and discussing Malcolm Evans' book, Tackling Torture Prevention in Practice. I have a show and tell, this is the book, and um, I'm really delighted that, there, that it's, it's here and that we have this really distinguished panel to talk about it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing the panel, but I am going to introduce them briefly now. And then when I've done that, we're going to have a short video, which is going to be about the artwork, which as you can see in the, um, in the screen, on the screen up there is on the cover of the book. So we will have that before we turn to the discussion. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Malcolm initially. So Malcolm, of course, is the author of this wonderful book. And he is now the principal of Regents Park College in Oxford. And I know here at the Bonavera, we feel enormously blessed to have him in our sort of orbit um, because M Malcolm is an enormously distinguished human rights lawyer, um, both a scholar and a practitioner of human rights. And for those of you know, who know the Bonavera Institute well, it's precisely that interaction that we seek to foster here at the Bonavera. So we, we really feel that we are very fortunate to have him nearby. We're also delighted to be, that he's going to be talking about this book because it draws on his enormous experience on the challenge of working out how we do address, diminish, hopefully eradicate torture across the world. And that is not an easy task. And um, he served as nearly or 10 years as the chair of the uh, subcommittee, the UN subcommittee for the prevention of torture. And so he's really one of the best people to talk about how difficult that task is, what we've achieved and what we still have yet to achieve. Um, we're also fortunate to have this very distinguished panel, as I've said. Firstly, Rupert Skilbeck, um, the director of Redress uh, here at the Bonavera. Again, we've been very fortunate to work with Redress in a range of ways over the last, um, over the last seven years of our existence, including sending every year one of our um, students here from the University of Oxford to serve as, a, as an intern or a fellow at um, Redress, which has always been an enormously valuable experience. Um, so we're very uh, fortunate to have um, Rupert here this evening. And then we have one of our research visitors this term, Professor Juan Mendez, another enormously distinguished uh, human rights lawyer whose own personal background um, as an Argentinian uh, in the 1970s meant that he was a first-hand experience of human rights abuses, and I think it has defined his career, his humanity, and his commitment uh, to human rights ever since. So it's been wonderful to have you here this term, Juan, and we're very delighted that you've joined the panel. And then we're going to be joined online by Dr. Silvia Casale, who unfortunately wasn't able to be with us this evening. Uh, Silvia is an independent crim criminologist who's worked as a member of the Parole Board of England and Wales, and who's an independent consultant to the Prisons Inspectorate here in the UK. Uh, she has a lot of practical experience of how one deals with the challenge of eradicating torture uh, in, in the UK. And we're, we're looking forward very much, Sylvia, I hope you're hearing me um, to what you have to say in, in a little while. And finally, last but not least, but we are delighted to welcome Professor Rosa Friedman from the University of Reading, who is again a, an expert in the field of international human rights law with a particular interest in the human rights bodies, um, both the treaty bodies, but also the um, uh, uh, special mechanisms of international human rights law. Um, and we are um, we have, uh, hadn't met Professor Friedman, and in some ways she's a neighbour. So this is one of the wonderful things about these kind of events. You uh, get to meet more people and build our um, connections with people who are working uh, to promote and protect human rights across the world. So a warm welcome to you too, Rosa. Um, the structure this evening is that we'll start with this short video. Then Malcolm's going to introduce his book for about 10 minutes. Each of our panelists will speak for about 10 minutes. We'll give Malcolm a right of reply, and then hopefully we'll hear from you, the audience, because I know that there are many of you who've worked in this field as well, and we'll be enriched by your in inputs. We are both um, live streaming this, and we will be recording this, so just please be aware of that. And we know that we have a lot of people who are interested in this topic across the world and making it available on a live stream is an accessibility feature, which we, we like to promote if we can. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn over to Georgia, who's been a wonderful supporter of this and who happily knows how this tech works, I think. <laughs> Hi. 
אז זה דבר מיושר יותר. I could see a white figure and I thought it was surrounded by two like dark specters. I could see two dark specters. And on getting the rock home and carving out the white figure, I couldn't fit dark figures in, but I knew it was something to do with this white figure's death. And I couldn't find the, the arms. I was thinking, where is arms? And then I realized they were raised above his head. And then I knew, I thought, It's been formed. The man card looks like a man in his prime. Um, I don't know, there's a sadness about that. There's a man in his prime who's been flogged off to watches. There is no rips and flesh hanging off of it. But the whiteness of the stone is shot with. veins of dark which are actually like bruising so it looks like he's he's been badly beaten not from deciding whether they're back before and they decided to have it nestled into the rock you know as if he's he was just exhausted relating to my faith as a christian and um, there were moments when it reminded me of Jesus at the age of 33, uh, pre-crucifixion, being flogged. And it was quite emotional after that. I could feel a lot of emotion for this piece. And then I was thinking, who is going to buy a piece of a person being flogged? I think it was me. <laughs> well, my name is Malcolm Evans. Over 10 years from 2009 until the end of 2020, I was a member of a UN body called the UN Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture. I feel that my responsibility is to finish the piece and then when the person whose piece it is, when there's a, a union with the person whose piece it is and the sculpture, I feel that it begins to take on another story and another part of the sculpture's life. And what we did was travel around the world visiting places of detention in order to try to discover how people were being treated in places of detention in order to try to make it less likely that they would be subject to <laughs> of torture and human There is a kind of grace about the piece. And immediately I saw it, I couldn't take my eyes off it. The rock ran out and I thought, I'll have him standing in mud. So, um, and that kind of mix and feel trapped. The thing that struck me immediately about it was the way that it emerges. And it was precisely that. the way that it just grows out and the way that as a sculptor you found what was within this that spoke hugely to me about my experiences over the last 10 years, about going to places, seeing things which on the, on the outside look unremarkable, but what do you find when you look inside? And there was no question about really whether he was going to buy it because of such a good match with Malcolm's story and the Stone story. Because when I saw it, I needed it. Torture was often hidden away, but he wanted it to be open and exposed. So he has it in his front room. <laughs> I didn't really intend to put it here. Um, it was partly circumstance. But then it was more... I'd originally had a couple of places in mind. After all, it is quite large. And I would admit many people and being sat and their eye goes to it. Why is that there? And the entire point of my experiences in trying to tackle torture is that this is what far too many people do. They may know that something is wrong, they may know that something, but they just put it out of sight, or just keep it out of the way, or where they can look at it when it's exposed to look at it, or where they think they can also. And to me, I find it 
incredibly powerful just to have it here as a part of, of life because the terrible truth is torture and ill treatment is a part of life. It's part of life in Britain, this person here. That is something that they would never, ever be able to move beyond. They might be able to move beyond in some ways, but it is something that will always be a part of them. But it's also a part of all of us, the way that these things will allow to go on with it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and well done, all of you, for braving those dreadful elements. It's really nice to see you, and I hope that um, hope that you're going to really enjoy yourself because it's a fascinating talk we've got tonight. First of all, parish notices. Let's <laughs> talk um, things on the of November. I would imagine it's getting even faster. you know, for, for, for her. Um, what it said in that video is true, and as I think I'll be saying in a number of ways, and for those who've been able to look at the book, um, it's entirely true. This was a difficult book to write. It was a real struggle. And finding the language, the means, and the way of writing something like this was, 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 was difficult. Um, and I want to thank the Bonavero this evening for giving us the opportunity to be able to, to discuss this book, and particularly for the discussants who've come along to, to comment on it um, this evening, including Sylvia um, online. I, in different ways, owe huge debts of gratitude to, to all of you, to, to Rupert as the Chair of Redress. I am still able to work a little in the field by, by disclaimer, I'm Chair of the Redress Trust, and it's wonderful to work alongside Rupert in that capacity, knowing all the marvellous things that they do for torture survivors. Juan, former UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, who I was privileged to be able to spend time with when I was chair of the, the UN subcommittee. Sylvia, who, who is on screen, who for 12 years was the chair of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture, and for three years a uh, member and chair of the Subcommittee for Prevention of Torture before me. She very much paved the way for what we were able to do coming after, and everyone in this field owes a huge debt of gratitude to here and to Rosa. Now, Rosa, you, you probably don't know how important you are to the genesis of this book, but you wrote... Um, your own book about things to do with the UN some years year, years ago. And I remember having a conversation with you many years ago when you described it to me. I hope you did, will forgive me for saying so. It was your, quote, angry book. <laughs> and I remember that and thinking, we've all got one slightly angry book within us. And so when I was thinking this, I want to write a, a bit of an angry book, a little bit like Rosa. And, and so it's so nice that you are able to, to be here this evening. You may think it's a bit of a risk for me to say, how nice it is to have them here when I have no idea at all what it is they're about to say. Um, but oddly, I'm not so worried about that at all. Not because I'm disinterested in what they have to say. I'm deeply interested in, in what to have to say. Um, it was a bit of a high-risk strategy for them to agree to speak because they agreed to do so without having read the book. 
Um, it didn't feel like a high risk strategy for me, not because of my confidence in the book, but really for something which I just want to draw your attention to in the I'm an academic still at the end of the day, only now you can get away with a, a thing in the preface called the note on notes. <laughs> but I do just want to read this one brief passage from the, the note on notes, because I do think it's, it's quite important to understand this book as a whole. It says, and this isn't because of academic laziness, I'm not citing materials to support my arguments, for I'm not offering any. I'm setting out my thoughts, observations, and beliefs. And as I'm the sole source of these, citing materials to bolster them is neither necessary nor indeed appropriate. I take full responsibility for what I think, as well as for what I write. And as it is a largely personal account, the reader, frankly, must just take it or leave it. <laughs> That's an odd thing for an academic to write. But there again, in many ways, I think this in, entire book is an odd thing for an academic to write. I've not written a book like it before. I doubt I ever will um, again. It's been a long journey to get to the point where I was able to even think about writing this book. My entire ac academic career, in fact, when I started as a as a, as a, yeah, I was young once, as a, as a young as a junior academic in, in, in Bristol University. I did read an article in a law journal in the days when young academics had nothing to do except read journals in academic journals. Um, and it was by Antonio Cassese. And it was describing his first years as chair of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture. And it was of great interest to me. And I ended up very quickly segueing, to use that word, to someone who was also in the audience tonight, my old friend Rob, Rob Morgan, who was professor at Bristol, and we had some conversations because he was being asked to work with that committee in its early years in order to try to basically work out how you visit places of detention. How do you make the idea that, that the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture, which is focused on prevention, actually works in practice? And that led me into quite a long journey. The journey, first of all, studying as an academic, the practice and the theory of prevention as an international lawyer. And in the course of that, being drawn closer to those who at that time were still working practically through civil society and others to try to create these instruments like the European Convention on the international stage, particularly the Association for the Prevention of Torture in Geneva, who were at the forefront of the work to try to get this established. So I found myself then working, if you like, in an activist role to try to bring this into being. And then, having done all that, and in 2002, along to, it, it was adopted, 2006, it came into force. A few years later, I found myself elected to the committee and then very shortly after, chair. So as an, as an abstract academic, if you like, as an advocate, and then as a practitioner trying to make sense of those different experiences. So my entire, I suppose, adult life, not even my academic life, has really been dominated by this in order, um, in, in so many different ways. And so you will assume that this book is absolutely full of great new understandings and great new insights, things that no one has ever thought about before. And I have to tell you, that is entirely untrue. If there is one thing that reviewing this, this book, if we can ever bear to bring ourselves to read what we read, that strikes, that strikes me straight within the eye, what am I telling you? I am telling you absolutely nothing. Or rather... I'm telling you absolutely nothing that we didn't know already. And I think that's the key point. I honestly don't know that of the big things that I'm trying to say in this book, that there are or should be any surprises. And to me, that is possibly the most shocking thing of all. What are some of these things? Well, working within the UN, that it is chronically ill-equipped in order to be able to undertake the tasks as have been given to it to most effectively protect human rights around the world as, it's, as things currently stand. And perhaps slightly more controversially, arguably, the way things currently stand, it's progressively ill-suited even to be able to do so, even though we must continue to hope and, and, and to work to make it better so. 
It tells us that torture and ill treatment is both a far bigger phenomena and a much more current phenomena than many of us still either want to believe or are prepared to believe, but also that the nature of the problem is so very different from, again, what we generally imagine or wish to, wish to believe it. That it is routine, that it is deeply embedded in very many systems and practices in so many places. It is not, shall we say, a special pathology. In too many, so many countries, for so much of the time, it is just the way things are done. And that isn't the way we so often go about attempting to tackle torture. It reminds us that the old truism is true, which is why truisms are truisms, that prevention is better than cure. And yet somehow we seem to have created an entire panoply of responses to torture, which whilst all so important in themselves, tend not to foreground the very thing that I would argue human rights are there to do, which is to try to ensure that people are able to enjoy their rights rather than to have the violations of those rights properly addressed and dealt with. Of course they must. But why is the idea of prevention something of a Cinderella within all this, when in fact it is the very thing, the enjoyment of these rights, that the entire architecture of human rights protection was designed to do that, to protect the rights? Why is that not, shall we say, more, more foregrounded than it is? Some other things that we perhaps all know, that most of the problems that I certainly ran into with the, um, with, with the SPT are things that we all already know about. There were very few things we saw when we went to any places of detention or looked into any criminal justice system that people are not well aware of. The overcrowding, the ill treatment, the beating, the inability to have access to appropriate, um, you know, advice and support through the processes, the effects of corruption, um, the, and so much more. All these things I touch on in the book, and I would challenge any one of you to be, you may be shocked by some of the ways in which I describe what we saw, but what we saw, were any of you truly to describe? going to be um, shocked to discover that these things take place on the scale that they take place? I hate to say, I think it probably is not, that bit is not going to shock you so much. The work of the SPT around which so much of this book revolves is focused on prevention. And as one of the most important documents or one of the most important phrases, I think that it ever came up with very early in its life, it described its approach to torture and the prevention of torture. And it simply said, there is no logical limit to the range of things which can have a preventive effect. If anything can have a preventive effect if it is the right thing in the right places. Therefore, effective prevention requires open minds when one looks at problems. But then how open are our minds when we look at the problem? And one of the things I try to wrestle with in the book is when we see things which are staring straight at us, why do we so often choose to explain them not in the way that we know, in the way that we think they should be, not the way that we actually understand them to be? particularly when making recommendations from UN bodies, other human rights vantage points, we tend to offer solutions which often are not realistic or not the real solutions to the real problems that we can see in front of us. Sometimes we end up living in a, a parallel or even a fantasy world in which changing laws, for example, somehow we're going to make a practical difference to what happens to people, you know, in places of detention. When we know it's not going to, we may want it to, we may believe it should, we may argue that it should, but when we know that it's not going to, are we really going, you know, you know really addressing the heart of the preventive problem? There is, I think, a failure to be sufficiently honest about what states can and cannot do in response to torture and ill treatment of detainees. We do tend to think in the international sphere that the state is all powerful, that it is the body that is able to rectify or remedy all problems. Perhaps it should be, but so often, maybe for all the wrong reasons, it isn't. 
And when it isn't, who are we deluding if we then try to simply work people who, even if they wanted to, do not have the capacity to be able to bring about the change we wish to bring about, when we folk, uh, rather than look to what could be done by talking to others. Certainly from an international dimension, sometimes talking to those others is just too difficult or just challenges too many notions or presuppositions about the way the world should be, the way the international community should work, the way that we understand things ought to be. And so I'm afraid there isn't, I think, a great deal in this book that's new. What I think it is doing, perhaps, is just trying to tell it as it is the way I saw it, as I reflect on 10 or 12 years of trying to make sense of these um, conundrums. And, you know, if there is anything that um, is new about the book, then it may be that it is simply reminding us, perhaps in starker terms than is sometimes the case, that this is a real problem that we need to wrestle with. And so the takeaway, perhaps, from it all is that we need to understand the problem better and accept the problem for what it is and what the real drivers of those problems are going to be if we are able to craft effective solutions to those problems, which is why, rather strangely, rather weirdly and rather quirkily, <clears throat> But with reason, I labelled the first half of the book, which goes through, if you like, the international approaches, the solution, and then left to the second half of the book, which reflected the practical experiences and the things which we encountered as the problem. Because what we tend to do, it strikes me, in the international space is come up with the solutions and apply them to problems rather than actually explore and understand the problems and then properly craft the solutions that would stand a better chance of, of, of addressing them. And there is, as I conclude, I think no greater problem that still needs to be tackled than torture. Thank you. It was very interesting to hear the story of the sculpture before we start it. And I think it's important to bear in mind the individuals that are behind the stories that are in this book, to the extent that one is able to do so. Uh, Redress has offices in London in The Hague and in our office in Vauxhall, we have very large pictures of some of our clients and former clients all around the walls, which is a way of reminding us, because we work all over the place, that there are real people behind these stories and it's important to bear that in mind. Lawyers can tend to get very technical and start talking about things in a rather inhuman way or detached way and so remembering that is a really crucial element of it. Malcolm said that the book was uh, difficult to write and I must say I found it quite difficult to read, not that it was uh, particularly long or anything, but I spend most of my day reading about torture in one way or another and what was particularly troubling about this one was the casual way in which a lot of the uh, behavior in the prisons and the places of detention that are described in the second half of the book was done. It was often done by negligence, by incompetence, and by lack of caring at all. Not specifically a high profile case of cruelty, but an inhuman behavior just by not bothering. And I think that was very difficult to read that over and over again with different examples where someone just couldn't be bothered to find another padlock you know, in order to, to, to spread around the prisoners leading to overcrowding, or just couldn't be bothered to clean up the mess that sometimes took place. Uh, and that um, inhumanity came across in a rather powerful way. A lot of the book deals with um, the question of the distinction between uh, torture and cruel and inhuman and degrading punishment. And this is where the lawyers can really get uh, into the detail in a rather disjointed way. This is important because it does come up all the time. Uh, torture is seen as different, as the book makes clear, and governments regard it very differently to other forms of human rights violations. Uh, we had a meeting recently with the new uh, consortium against torture, which brings together all the international NGOs working on torture with the EU Special Representative for Human Rights, Eamon Gilmore. And he was saying in the countless meetings he's had over the several years, he's had that role with governments. The one thing no one will ever say is, yes, we torture people. They will always say, no, 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 no. There's no torture in our country. Our police uh, are trained to the highest international standards. It doesn't take place. Uh, and so there is that uh, uh, 
Rubicon that won't be crossed, that, that governments will not accept torture. So it does have that distinct element when we're dealing with trying to prevent it as well. And when the uh, the first case against a Western European government finding torture rather than in human treatment, the Salmouni case, the French government went completely nuts about it. This is an outrageous court. It's in France. There's only one French judge. How dare they tell us that we tortured someone? There's still a huge stigma uh, if you find torture and as we have seen in the book, the distinction has been made between with government to try and say, well, it's just in human treatment, um, but torture, we don't do that. This can be really problematic. Um, we have it as a practitioner working, representing people who've been tortured or otherwise ill-treated all around the world. We often have to deal with that with our clients because you have to give them advice as to what's likely to happen and the claims, the legal claims you can make. And so you have to go through that conversation with your clients as to what as to the legal classification of what happened to them and that can be very difficult to deal with i think uh the european court sometimes deals with it very effectively by just saying it's a violation of article three without specifically saying which type it is and i think there's a lot to be said for that you get the same thing in international criminal law where people obsess about the difference between genocide and a crime against humanity they're both fairly serious international crimes and uh, being so concerned about whether the, the law allows one or the other perhaps is missing the point but what the book emphasizes, I think, is that there is this, uh, what you could perhaps call a common or garden variety of uh, ill treatment that happens on a daily basis in countries all around the world, in police stations and prisons all around the world, which has a real risk of not having enough attention focused on it. Uh, there's a risk that by focusing on the more high profile cases that are perhaps more politically or, or in the media more, uh, you miss those ones out. It even comes down to the level of running an NGO that deals with torture. When we have to put together our strategy, you have to decide which issues to focus on. And one of the issues that came up in our recent strategy where Malcolm was uh, advising in his role as chair of our board was, of course, as an NGO, you've got to focus on the high profile things. You've got to focus on the things to be blunt where donors will give you money uh, and things that are in the press and you're going to get attention. This sort of uh, common or garden variety ill treatment is difficult to, to in, encourage people to work on. And so that is uh, unfortunate if that's what happened because the numbers I suspect are vast when compared with other forms of torture that perhaps attract more attention. There's another part of the book that's very interesting which is about the, uh, the, the recommendation made by the SPT to the relevant authorities to do something about what they find. Uh, that sets out very uh, cleverly exactly the problem we have of how to tackle torture and put in place preventative measures. Often what we're looking for in strategic litigation against torture and getting reparations for torture is to put in place measures of non-repetition. And that essentially requires the same sort of process to find out exactly who it is who can make the change, what is the change you want to do, and who's going to pay for it. And if you can't get down to that level of specificity, then you're not going to have a real impact. And so the book, I think, in those couple of chapters looking at that uh, emphasizes the real difficulties of making that work. Lastly, I mean, I think there are uh, interesting things that could come out. One of the challenges that, that Pat Malcolm suggests in the book is, is the SPT, to some extent, uh, has a mandate to prevent torture, but has ended up focusing on, on visiting places of detention. What more could be done to look more preventatively rather than looking at it after the event? Um, I had a recent challenge from uh, one of our donors, actually, who said, well, it's great that you're always suing people after torture is taking place, but why can't we do legal actions beforehand to prevent it from happening? And so I think that is a challenge to the human rights community and the anti-torture movement to focus perhaps a little bit more on those elements of it. And I, for one, am always a, fa a fan of introducing safeguards, even though they are technical, um, but they do work. And it's worth bearing in mind here in the United Kingdom that the Police and Criminal Evidence Act put in place a number of very practical safeguards, which I must say I keep coming back to, Tape recording of interviews makes it very difficult to brutalize someone in an interview because it comes across in the tape. Having a custody sergeant who has responsibility for seeing who comes into a police station and when, as we see from the book, they can be fiddled with those records, but it, it changes the nature of what's going on. Uh, the, the strong presumption in Section 76 of PACE and Section 78, the exclusion of evidence that flips the burden onto the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the evidence was not obtained by oppression exists in very, very few legal systems. Uh, we did a report on it a while ago. That legal change would be quite effective, and there are other ones perhaps uh, more relevant to the points that were brought out in Malcolm's book, but there are safeguards that be, can be put in place. 
So I think that is the challenge that the book uh, puts to us, even though Malcolm uh, suggested it wasn't uh, making specific recommendations, but I think what it does do is challenge us to address this particular form of human rights violation that can be hidden in plain sight, as the book suggests, uh, a form of human rights violation that doesn't gather the headlines, doesn't gather the attention of the top politicians around the world. How can we, as the human rights community and the anti-torture movement, effectively address that? And I think that that is what the book is encouraging us to do. I need to start by thanking Justice O'Regan for giving me the opportunity to participate in this panel, um, particularly to, it's a privilege for me to uh, comment on uh, uh, Sir Michael, Sir Malcolm Evans's uh, book. Um, I have had the, the, the privilege, as he mentioned, of uh, appearing with him at the General Assembly of the United Nations several times in uh, several years in a row. Um, but, it, but, but more than the ceremonial part of, you know, presenting our annual reports, uh, there were always occasions for substantive discussion about what works, about uh, what can be done to improve the performance of uh, uh, treaty bodies and of uh, special procedures. Um, so I learned a lot uh, from Ma Malcolm uh, at the time, um, and some of the ideas that, uh, that I learned have remained with me uh, as I continue to do uh, what I can to follow up on the things I did as a special rapporteur on torture and uh, focus particularly on prevention. And that's why I think it's, it's a great opportunity for me to, to, to comment on this book. Um, but I also want to uh, congratulate uh, Malcolm for uh, producing this book uh, and also for his uh, um, appointment here at Oxford, uh, which is uh, a great tribute to uh, the work that he has been doing academically and practically for a long, long time. Um, and um, uh, I want to um, uh, uh, concentrate on prevention of torture because that is uh, the thrust of the book, I believe, and um, and particular of, of the experience, the professional and, and uh, experience that uh, brought Malcolm to to write it. Uh, in uh, the in in uh, uh, the, the the premise of the optional protocol on the uh, to the Convention Against Torture is that having a presence in places of detention. Uh, effectively, you know, makes torture, uh, you know, less uh, frequent, at least. And um, when I when I first read about those things, I was just coming out of South America and having been a torture victim, uh, knowing also where torture happens and how and by whom. Uh, I was quite skeptical. I said, uh, I, I think, you know, these uh, organs are going to visit places of detention that uh, are, you know, kind of uh, uh, cleaned up to receive them and that uh, are not the places where torture happens anyway. Um, but I've come around to understanding that it plays uh, an important role. It's not just uh, the ceremonial part of uh, uh, walking into a place of detention, but knowing what questions to ask, knowing how to insist on having uh, conversations without witnesses with people who may have been tortured, uh, being able to uh, get information as to where and when the torture happened. Uh, all of those things uh, do go a long way uh, to prevent. But the most important thing is that uh, it's uh, it's a regular and, and periodic presence, but it's also the surprise presence in the places of detention uh, that actually has a preventive effect. And uh, the preventive effect uh, happens precisely because uh, the people who actually do the visits um, are selected for their impartiality and independence. Uh, they don't take uh, no for an answer. 
they go to places where they are supposed to go uh, and they insist on seeing every part, every uh, closet in the prison. And uh, doing that does, um, you know, uh, uh, put the pr uh, prospective torturer uh, on the lookout and, and does have the effect of, uh, uh, of, do, uh, of uh, preventing uh, torture, or at least making it less uh, pervasive and less less uh, less frequent. Uh, it's also the fact that the uh, optional protocol uh, establishes not only uh, a, a body, a, a treaty body that has shown over the years to be very effective and and to be able to produce excellent reports and recommendations to states, and thereby creating and and developing standards for. Uh, how states have to comply with their obligations under international human rights law, but it also creates national preventive mechanisms uh, that are supposed to be local and that sometimes work better than others. They're not always as good, but the SPT particularly has done excellent work in, in first uh, defending and protecting the integrity of those national preventive mechanisms, but also training them and helping them um, have the kind of authority that they need to have to uh, visit uh, prisons more more frequently and more regularly than an international body can do with 194 countries to to uh, to, to visit. So uh, it's this uh, the independence and impartiality and the combination of uh, local forces uh, that are also independent and impartial with. Uh, a treaty body uh, with the reputation and the and the actual uh, performance that it has produced over the years that does have an important uh, preventive effect. Uh, we're always in front of a glass half full or half empty, uh, but it's um, um, uh, it, it, we should not be uh, dismissive of the um, uh, uh, the contributions that the SBT uh, has made over the years and that uh, Malcolm himself has made as, as, as its uh, chair uh, 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 over the same years. Um, the, the important uh, uh, thing that I want to, to stress is that uh, prevention has come late to the, uh, the human rights movement. We have learned to react to violations, but we have taken a long time to uh, to work on, uh, like Malcolm and Rupert have said, on uh, how, how do we uh, make it so that uh, torture doesn't happen in the first place. Uh, but we are, we are uh, and not only on torture, but on all human rights violations, we are uh, on the road to catching up. Uh, and uh, both uh, by treaty making, uh, treaty uh, uh, writing, for example, um, the, the Genocide Convention of 1948 is a convention about prevention of genocide, but it says precious little about how to prevent genocide. And it's been only after the end of the Cold War that the international community has started coming around with some ideas, uh, you know, weak as they are so far, uh, about what works in prevention of genocide. The Convention Against Torture is more recent, it's like, uh, what, 40 years later, uh, and um, uh, it, does, it also concentrates on prevention and does have some uh, specific standards uh, on prevention, like uh, the um, periodic review of practices of uh, law enforcement and other bodies, that is uh, an objective uh, standard that states have to comply with, the human rights education and the insistence on training and uh, continuing training of uh, all uh, uh, aspect, all, all, all personnel in the administration of justice so that torture doesn't occur. But most importantly, I, I think the Convention Against Torture mentions prevention as a key uh, obligation of the state. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a standard that allows us to, to judge whether uh, actions taken by the state uh, go in the direction of prevention or go in the direction of encouraging more torture. And that is an important standard that allows us to um, analyze uh, uh, behavior of states 
uh, and um, and encourage uh, 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 you know development of standards. Um, I've always thought that uh, uh, the obligation to investigate, prosecute, and punish torture is central to prevention, and I still believe it. I think uh, all the all the things that we can do around torture, if they are surrounded by impunity for torture, are going to be uh, less effective. Uh, not necessarily ineffective completely, but less effective because the impunity is what, in my mind at least, encourages uh, the torturer to continue torturing. The, the knowledge that uh, there's no price to pay for it uh, is going to be the, the main factor for the pervasive, pervasiveness of, of torture. But I've also come to understand that investigating, prosecuting, and punishing, effectively punishing torture is just a piece of the puzzle. But it, even by itself, it doesn't prevent torture from happening again. Uh, it would be interesting to say, well, once we break the cycle of torture, torture will finish. Uh, unfortunately, we've learned that that's not the case. There are many countries that recovered democracy and have, um, you know, investigated and prosecuted torture effectively. And there are torturers serving time, but yet that doesn't uh, by itself at least eliminate uh, the practice of torture. And so that's why it's important to um, understand the limitations of uh, all uh, all of the things that international human rights law requires of states uh, and we uh, and understand that we have to tackle torture as the, uh, the book says uh, with a holistic uh, approach that uh, that en encompasses um, the absolute prohibition and therefore the uh, the and the, uh, and the fact that um, uh, the nature of torture as an international crime that then requires states to investigate, prosecute, and punish each uh, case of torture. But we also have to have um, uh, preventive mechanisms and preventive suggestions. And there, the SPT and Malcolm uh, have uh, made enormous contributions to the normative framework in which we operate. Uh, and, and the normative framework has gone in the direction of prevention more explicitly in later years. For example, the Convention on Disappearances established the obligation of re uh, registry of all detentions and of um, you know, publicity around, surrounding every place of detention. Uh, and that is supposed to have a preventive effect, at least it, has, it, it is supposed to prevent disappearances from happening. Uh, in, in the same in the same vein, for example, uh, the, the international community has been uh, updating and and refreshing some of the uh, non-binding standards that we have been using effectively, I think. Uh, but we need to update them all the time. And for example, the standard minimum rules on the treatment of prisoners, now called the Nelson Mandela rules, since two thousand and fifteen. Uh, now incorporate rules, specific rules about solitary confinement, because we had not reckoned with the fact that while we were fighting physical torture, the mental torture of solitary confinement had been growing around us and growing in all countries for different reasons and for different uh, um, for different purposes, but growing and it's still growing. But now we have at least a reaction against uh, solitary confinement and it's consecrated in a, um, a non-binding legal instrument like the Nelson Mandela rules that has a long history of being considered um, effective and, uh, and um, you know, uh, authoritative in what uh, places of detention uh, have to be in terms of their conditions of detention. And, and the same can be said about, um, for example, the, uh, the Istanbul Protocol that uh, on the on the documentation of torture that uh, from 1999 has had a, a, an important effect on uh, allowing us to to determine whether torture has happened or not uh, and for what purposes. It's not only for punishment but, but also for the application of the uh, exclusionary rule, for example. Uh, 
but with the experience, there is now a new Istanbul Protocol 2022, in fact, that has been uh, drafted uh, incorporating uh, all of the experience of those 20 years. And uh, <clears throat> there's also the, the Minnesota Protocol. This is not so much about uh, torture, but of uh, ex extrajudicial executions, but that one also has been updated uh, uh, through the work of uh, our, um, you know, uh, well-liked and remembered uh, Christoph Heinz when he was a special rapporteur <clears throat> on uh, summary and arbitrary executions. So the normative framework is is uh, uh, constantly expanding and constantly improving, and and it benefits from experience and and it creates new standards. Um, one important aspect that I remember. Um, on on standard setting uh, that I remember anecdotally conversations with Malcolm about is the question of how we uh, determine uh, whether restraints um, uh, on on mental health grounds, not on not on prisoners, but on on people uh, uh, hospitalized for mental health reasons when restraints cross the, the line into cruel and human undergraded treatment or even torture. And uh, we had excellent discussions with the SPT and with the Committee on uh, the Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, and with the CAT, with the Committee Against Torture. And we didn't, I don't think we got to quite an agreement on that, but the discussion goes on. And it, it, it's important that it goes on and it, because it creates, um, you know, awareness and consciousness about the fact that the definition of torture in international law is not meant to be the, the uh, to, to challenge only the torture, uh, brutal physical torture of a, a political opponent. It, 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 it has to apply to every walk of life where uh, the cruelty of torture uh, including when there is no medical necessity for it, uh, has to uh, the international law has to be able to say something, something about it. And um, I, 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 I want to uh, to say that this this book that Malcolm has uh, uh, written, uh, because of his experience, will definitely make a contribution to the continuing expansion of these standards, uh, because we need. To have standards, we need also to apply the standards and to make sure that they are, uh, in one way or another, uh, implemented and, if, in fact, if anything, enforceable as well. But um, the 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 contribution that this text is going to be is going to be making to generating uh, those conversations and eventually those standards is uh, going to get us closer to the point where we can envisage a future without torture, an eradication of torture, um, which is what prevention is all about. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's over to you, can you hear me? You're nice. Sylvia, can you hear us? I can now, yes, thank you. It, it, it stopped for a moment, but now it's fine. We're a little can bit you hear me? So if you could just be careful about your time, we'd be grateful. Thank you. Yes, of course. Um, I must apologise that I can't uh, join you in person, but rather I have to be online for medical reasons. Um, but I'm very glad to be here to... Um, uh, welcome the launch of Malcolm's book. I've admired Malcolm's writing ever since I read his first torture book, um, which he wrote, um, co-authored with um, Rod Morgan, who's also here today, uh, a book about the CPT, and I was there at the time. So I'm delighted that I can be here um, for the launch of his latest book concerning torture. I think Malcolm has captured the essence of prevention of all forms of ill treatment in this book, and, and also written movingly about some of the challenges of trying to do so at the universal level. Um, 
his account really resonates deeply with my experience at the beginning of the committee's journey at the United Nations. I, I started there in 2007 and was the first chair of the committee. It was a painful experience. Um, and I think that we see from Malkin's book that committed as we are to the prevention of torture, it is a painful experience, not least to, to witness the pain that happens in so many places of deprivation of liberty. I want to mention three issues briefly. I know there isn't much time. Firstly, assessing risk, because that's important for prevention. Um, support for preventive monitoring. And finally, the National Preventive Mechanism, which have, have already been mentioned, that unique feature of the optional protocol. Assessing risk. Markham explains that we do indeed include investigation in, of um, forms of ill treatment, including torture, in the work that we do on the ground. And um, that is essential for persuading the people who are in authority to embrace change. It may not sound like an easy combination, and it isn't in, in practice. But when we go on visits to places of deprivation of liberty, we are observing how the systems work and the patterns of practice. And when we identify signs of ill treatment, we do need to follow up and investigate them and to get as much information and hard evidence as we can, medical evidence, physical evidence, um, various sources of information so that we can establish whether this is actually happening as alleged or as observed in its results. If it's an aberration, a member of staff going rogue, or whether it's evidence of recurring or system, systemic risk. Malcolm explains we're not there to prosecute and indeed that needs to be underscored. The evidence we collect is in order to explain to the authorities that we know what's happening. We have examples and hard evidence. And that is why we they need to improve the situation as is their obligation under the optional protocol. Um, I have yet to meet an authority that embraced change, but I would say that some do try to make change to mitigate the risks of ill treatment. And the changes are often insufficient, but as Malcolm has said, the prevention of, of ill treatment is a long-term endeavor and it's never over. I don't say that in a pessimistic way. I just am a realist about this. It's not going to be eradicated while human nature is what it is. Secondly, support for preventive monitoring. In the particular, yeah. the support for this SPT, the role of support for the SPT falls to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the OHCHR. And Malcolm has rightly praised and thanked and paid tribute to individual staff members of the OHCSR who have assisted the SPT. In 2007, when we started, we experienced, I experienced particularly, the glaring contrast between the support given to the SPT the committee for prevention of on for, for prevention and the CPT, the European um, body that has a lot of similarities of, in its mandate. Um, not not surprisingly, since there was a good deal of drafting based on CPT convention, the contrast unfortunately still continues to this day. In two thousand and seven, we started with. One um, staff member seconded from the CPT secretariat working in the OHCHR. 
for a short period. 1.5 members of UH, OHCHR staff working partly for the SPT and partly for other people, other bodies, because that's the staffing rule for the OHCHR. Uh, consider that for decades, the CPT had a 14 um, person secretariat, expert staff working exclusively for the CPT. Um, and also that the CPT has 46 member states to visit, but the SPT has double that. So you can do the math. Um, Malcolm Book mentions that the staff support has increased a little bit since we started in 2007, but I think it's nowhere near sufficient. And then I'd like to say something finally about the national preventive mechanisms. Malcolm says that helping establish the NPMs and um, supporting them in their work is the SPT's most important role. And I do agree very strongly with that. The NPMs have the potential to change the whole landscape of preventive monitoring, and they have done so. They're on the spot, they know the language, they understand the context, and according to the OPCAT, they should be independent. And Malcolm says, I quote, the establishment of the NPMs has resulted in independent oversight of places of detention in countries where previously none had existed at all. How about he is? Some oversight bodies, of course, as has been said, are a bit more independent than others. But the important thing is that places of deprivation of liberty are open to outside scrutiny. And that's a huge step forwards. It's not the end of the story, but it's a huge step forward. Malcolm's book, however, end of it, identifies as a fundamental problem. The SPT doesn't have a discrete budget to work with NPMs, even though the OPCAT plainly states that this is the work it should do. I leave on the table the question, how is it that after nearly 17 years, this SPT is still only funded to meet in Geneva and to visit member states. Fortunately, the SPT has been very creative in finding ways to work with NPMs nonetheless, including through high level talks. I salute Malcolm's stamina in working so hard and for so long to develop this SPT, the, the committee, and for overcoming many, many obstacles. Hats off to you, Malcolm, for tackling torture. Thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak at this event. I feel, well, I feel like I'm the one out in the room because I'm not a specialist on torture. Um, and yet, having picked up this book and not been able to put it down, I feel like I've understood more about torture from reading this, what is it, 240 page book than from my entire career in human rights. Malcolm, what you've done in writing your angry book is write an accessible and engaging book that I could hand to a student of any discipline that I have handed to my mother and that I think should be handed to every policymaker, whether they're working on prisons, whether they're working in human rights or beyond. Because you've taken the solution, the law, and you've explained it in a way that we wish academics could teach in a classroom, right, all academics. You've explained it in a way that's clear, that identifies the problems, that shows that the definitions of torture don't fully work. And as you say, they're a ceiling, not a, they're a floor, not a ceiling. And then you've shown how they apply in practice. And this is the part of the book that I'm particularly keen on. I constantly hear from friends and family and students and other academics, why isn't the UN doing something? Now it could be doing something on any particular situation in the world. And they don't necessarily know what the UN is. Um, there's many parts of the UN. There's the UN who are the member states. There are the UN that's the secretariat and the funds and the programs and the agencies. 
And then there's the UN that's sitting here and in the audience, the independent experts who are out taking the ideals of human rights and making them a reality on the ground. What you've done with this book is take possibly the most difficult part of the UN human rights system, the SPT, the part that some people don't even call a treaty body and no one fully understands. And you've created a book that explains it and that sets out for those who might want to use it, whether they're victims or survivors, whether they're policymakers, whether they're NGOs and advocates, whether they're students or whether they're scholars. So your angry book is actually an incredibly useful book. And the other part of the book, and it links to this, that we don't often get is the insider outsider approach. Many academics, sit and they write and they might do some field work and they might do some interviews, but they're not insiders within a system that is seeking to prevent and to protect and promote human rights. And many of the experts and practitioners who are in that system are not themselves academics. They don't necessarily take a step back and see the whole system or see the whole human rights matrix and projects outside of their area of complete expertise. You are one of those rare jewels, Malcolm, that does both. And I'm very fortunate to know you and to know very few handful of others who have done both. But none of them bar you has written a book about it. I've nagged a few of them in the past because I think that the world needs to understand this insider, outsider approach. And I could sum it up, and I'm going to keep this very short because I know we're running out of time. I could sum it up in this way. We as lawyers, are trained to be idealists. We think about any law and it's an ideal and we want it to happen, right? International relations people are realists. They look at what happens on the ground and Anne-Marie Slaughter talks about bringing the two together, bridging that divide. And when we apply that to human rights, we can think of human rights as a law, an ideal, or we can think about it as a tool to lobby for effective political change. And Malcolm, what you have done with your career and what you've done with this book is show how to lobby for effective political change, how to go out on the ground. And they are some of the most harrowing stories that I've read or I've heard because, as you say, they're so mundane. Because, as you say, when you walked in, the people there thought this was normal. That's what makes them harrowing. And you've taken those and you've used human rights to lobby for effective political change. You had a key message on page 46. It was hidden away towards the end, but it stood out for me. You said that the job is to find anything, I'm paraphrasing, to make things better and then to go out and do it. This book shows that you have done that throughout your career and you will continue to do so, I'm sure. But I think it will also inspire other generations of people who read this to do the same. So thank you for letting me speak tonight and congratulations. Well, we thank you to our panelists for a really rich array of contributions. Um, 